I am so thankful to be with you and for this final session. I just want to say uh, on behalf of our church family and myself, thank you to Pepperdine for the creative ways that you serve us all year round and that you continue to promote the health of church leadership and churches alike. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Randy and Rick and Dan and Fate for your messages. And I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, by the time Mike got to the end, everyone else had said no, and that's how he ended up with me. But I am thankful that we're going to get to do this study together. And so would you please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. As you're turning to Luke chapter 7, I want to tell you about a situation uh, that I was in when I was growing up. Uh, I grew up north of uh, California. I grew up in Oregon. And my dad and I took a special trip when I was 19 years old. Uh, one morning, we got up super early, and we left Portland, and we were headed to the coast. And we got to spend the entire day together. But the day got off to an auspicious start. We stopped at a gas station on the way to the Oregon coast. And I was kind of sleepy because, I mean, we left Portland around 5.30 a.m., and I look up and I realize my dad has gone into the women's restroom at this gas station. The gas station doors at this time were on the outside of the station. So, you know, it was kind of funny. I actually pulled out a camera. I took a picture. We joked about it. He said, I didn't even notice, right? We went to the coast. Well, we were on our way back to Portland later that evening, and we were getting in uh, kind of late, but Dad said, well, hey, do you want to stop at KFC and uh, get something uh, to eat? You know, and I was like, well, sure, it'll be a late dinner, but that sounds good. So we pull up to KFC, and he's like, man, I got to go to the restroom, right? And so my dad and I, we pull up, and he darts into the KFC, and I'm following him, but I'm about 10 steps behind him, and... He goes into the women's restroom again. But this time, we're inside the restaurant. And he's ahead of me, and I can't get to him fast enough. So I get there, and I realize he, he, he has made a mistake again. So I open the door, and I say, Dad, you're in the women's restroom. He says to me, close the door, it's too late. And as I'm closing the door, I realize that underneath the stall, where of course you can't see anything embarrassing, I see a set of high-heeled shoes and I was like, this is not going to end well. Well, my dad came out and decided that we would actually not eat at KFC. <laughs> we went back out, we hopped in that pickup, and we took off because I don't think he wanted to face the lady that was on the other side of that stall. Have you ever been somewhere where you knew, I don't belong here. This is not where I belong. Well, sometimes it can be as comical as missing the sign on the restroom door. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about a different kind of not belonging. It's a kind of not belonging where you actually could belong should belong, would belong, if we knew how to love well. Jesus tells some stories through his actions, parables, and teachings. And in the book of Luke, what is fascinating is most of the stories have something to do with bringing people to the center who were pushed to the margins, bringing people into the middle who were kept on the periphery, redoing the seating chart. So those that were used to having a front row are now on the back row, and the people that were assigned to the back row suddenly find themselves on the front row, and it's front row. Because not everyone agrees with how Jesus has rearranged the seating chart. We're going to look at these three stories real quickly. The first one is in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 down through 50. Jesus is invited to dinner, and at this dinner party that is hosted by this religious leader, uh, Jesus is the welcome guest, they're there at the meal, everything appears to be going fairly well, but this lady slips in, and uh, rather than being on the invite list, or knocking, or getting the, the, the host a permission, she just goes over, and she gets down by Jesus' feet. And she's weeping, and I don't know if she could choke out any words or not, but her, her tears are falling, and they're serving as 
water to wet his feet, and she has nothing, so she wipes them with her hair. She wasn't ready for this moment. It just was something that was impulsive. She heard Jesus was there. She had to meet him. She had to say something. She had to connect. And so in she went, unprepared, ill-prepared, and there she was. The host of the banquet looks at her and begins to analyze Jesus. He didn't need to analyze her. He already made a decision about her. She's sinful. She's immoral. She's one of those women. And so he already knows what to do with her, and he's already done it. He already knows that someone like that doesn't belong at a dinner like he's hosting. But Jesus doesn't seem to get it. He, he doesn't seem to know the rules. In fact, Jesus is the only one that doesn't get it. You see, of all the things that the Pharisee and this sinful woman might disagree about, there's one thing they agree on. She does not belong there. They both agree on that. But Jesus doesn't agree with either one of them. You see, Jesus believes she belongs. And she wants the, he wants the woman to know, no, you've got it wrong. You belong. He wants the religious leader to know, no, you've got it wrong. She belongs. They agree, and Jesus disagrees. And this pushes us to the next story. In chapter 11, beginning in, or chapter 15, excuse me, beginning in verse 11, we get this additional parable of the chapter 15 parables. The Bible says Jesus told a parable, but it's a parable with three parts. It's a parable about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. The parable is set up by the fact that Jesus has invited to the front seats the people that are the outcasts. The religious leaders have been now assigned to the outer seating, and they don't like that. So Jesus tells these, this parable with three parts about belonging. There's a boy who's blown up his relationship with his family. He's messed up his own life. In fact, he's in such a desperate situation that he can't even eat with pigs. He wakes up and says, I've got to go home. But, but he knows he doesn't belong at home. He gets home and he sees his father and later his older brother. His older brother is furious about the arrangement. And bear in mind, the older brother doesn't express his fury to his younger brother. He only expresses it to his father because the older brother already knows what to do with the younger brother. He's a mess up. He's a misfit. He doesn't belong at home. And if there's, of all the things that the younger brother and the older brother probably disagree on, there's one thing they both agree on. He doesn't belong in the family. But here we find the outlier again. Jesus, speaking on behalf of the father, says, well, you're both wrong. He says to his younger son, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. You do belong in the family. He says to the older brother, no, you've got it wrong as well. He belongs in the family. Both of you are wrong. We move ahead to chapter 18. And we get to verses 9 through 14, and it's a scene in church. You have a religious leader at the temple, church, and you have a tax gatherer. And the tax gatherer knows he doesn't belong. He's there, but his skin is crawling. In fact, because no one else will beat him, he beats his own chest. He feels so out of place. He knows he doesn't belong with God. He knows he doesn't belong in a holy place, an unholy man in such a holy place. And of all the things that the tax gatherer and the Pharisee would disagree on, the one thing they both agree on is he doesn't belong. In fact, publicly, because the tax gatherer is expressing how bad he feels inwardly, the Pharisee expresses it 
outwardly says, I thank God that I'm not like that guy. I'm happy that my life looks like this because at least it doesn't look like that. And do you notice he gets no rebuttal from the tax gatherer because you see this is something they both agree upon. He doesn't belong. There it is again. God steps in. And through the voice of Jesus, through the lips and language of Jesus, he says, well, but you're both wrong. He says to the, to the tax collector, you don't, you don't get it. You, you came to the right place. An unholy person coming to a holy place, that's the right thing to do. Where else would you go? Where else would you take a broken life except to the healer's house? Where else would you go? You actually went home healed and justified. You just didn't know it because you see you were wrong about where you belong. And hey, you religious leader, what is all this chatter over here? You're imagining that somehow you belong because you created a test that you can pass. You asked yourself a set of questions to which you already knew the answers. You gave yourself an examination of things that you had already completed. He said, none of that makes you holy. In fact, if anything, you have brought desecration into the holy place. You've brought pride where only humility belongs. Three stories. Six characters. All of them agree. That the woman, the son, and the tax collector don't belong. The only one who disagrees with all of them is God. God says, oh, no, 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 no. She actually belongs at your dinner table. He actually belongs in your home, your house, and your family, and your clothes. And he, he belongs in your church. He belongs in your worship service. I wonder, I wonder how we feel about those stories because I want to uh, maybe excavate something for some clarity. The issue in all three of these stories isn't uh, does Scripture teach that we ought to love everyone? That's not brought up in any of the stories. There's no quoting of Jesus. Jesus knows Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus knows Leviticus 19.18. Jesus knows these stories. He knows the great commands. He knows the Shema. Jesus could have whipped it out just like he did before he taught the story of the good Samaritan. He could have said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. The issue isn't, did Scripture say to love these people? That's not the problem. The problem with Jesus is he acts like they belong. Do you not remember that it was the religious leaders themselves who said to Jesus, you're right about the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Good job. We're experts in the law. Apparently, you attended Saturday school. It was synagogue. Apparently, you listened in Saturday school as well. You know the scripture. Jesus says, of course I know the scripture and so do you. You're just missing how it was meant to be applied. It wasn't just some general sense that we ought to love people. It's the specific sense that people need to know that they belong with the people of God. They belong at our dinner tables. They belong at the Lord's table. They belong in our homes and families and in our churches. And so do you. You see, you might relate to that immoral woman. You might relate to that son who has embarrassed yourself, your family, your church family. You might relate to that tax collector who feels like there's just really no way home. There's, I probably won't live long enough to clean all of this up. But God says, I got a message for you. You belong. 
I've got a plate at the table with your name on it. I've got clothing that will fit you perfectly. You've never lost your place in the house. And I want you in my family. Jesus says, I stretched my arms open on a cross to welcome you into the family. When they said, you know that Jesus guy, he's a friend of sinners. Jesus says, you finally got something we could all agree on. You see, Jesus chose us to be his friends. Let's live like we belong. 